Good morning and welcome to the second debate of the uh, Forum Press Europe. Uh, the topic now will be uh, the uh, Euro, uh, European Union crisis. Is it threatening the stability of the European Union or not? Uh, we are w looking uh, for the now with uh, our guests. We have uh, with us the MEPs uh, Rafael Praskowski and also Rui Tavares. We have uh, from the European Center for uh, European uh, Council for Foreign Relations, Mr. Thomas Klau, and from Dorzeji, uh, Poland, uh, Marek Magirowski. We also have uh, two of our most uh, assiduous readers, um, Patrick Dupont, François. François Dupont, sorry, from France, and Enrico Ramon uh, from Italy. So um, let's start with the first uh, big question around this table. Uh, European Union is now, uh, do you agree, um, Rafael Traskowski, with uh, uh, the, the idea that European Union is uh, uh, now in its worst moment since uh, its foundation? It, is it really uh, threatened uh, as, a, as a union uh, because of the financial crisis and its consequences and also the institutional crisis? Uh, the institutions are not working together as good as they should to make Europe go forward? Well, I mean, it's a, it's, it's a good question. I mean, obviously, we have to think, what does it really mean, you know, the worst crisis ever? Uh, how do you define that? I mean, one can look at the 70s when nothing was happening in the European Union. There was the so-called period of pure sclerosis. Uh, there was no hope for any development and so on and so forth. But if you look at a real crisis, especially in economic terms, I mean, it is very difficult to say that this is not one of the most uh, difficult times for the European Union. Uh, also for the institutions, because the institutions, you know, have been working for so many years uh, amazingly well for such an institutional creature which was created out of nothing uh, with something very original as an idea. Uh, but it came to a certain moment when we started having problems. Uh, basically because we invented a very ambitious political project, European Monetary Union, uh, which was not accompanied by all the needed institutional and constitutional changes. We had no economic policy to underpin it. So yes, I mean, it's very difficult to deny the fact that we are in very, very difficult times. But I'm an optimist because the Union usually uses crises to actually reform itself, and I don't think it will lead to disintegration. Mm -hmm. Um, do you do you believe it's uh, the worst crisis the uh, European Union has ever uh, faced? Do you share this uh, Eurosclerosis uh, word um, Mr. Traskowski just used? No, I, I think it is indeed a, a very serious crisis. Uh, one that could be solved by the usual mechanisms that we have seen. We have seen other deadlocks, we have seen other problems. But that works all very well until the day it doesn't. Uh, just if, if we go back 100 years to 1913 instead of to 2013, you'll see that the, the setup for European democracy and the balance of powers was already there, and it had been working for a couple of generations until it didn't. Uh, but in 1913, everybody was very optimistic that you know the French ambassador was having dinner with the, with the German Kaiser and the German ambassador was having dinner with the French president, and everything seemed fine. I think that we are at a point where the economic developments of w w when you have this kind of collapse and maybe depression in some countries, such as mine already a depression, on top of an institutional structure that uh, does not carry legitimacy enough because it can, it may have had in the past a legitimacy of results, it has produced good results, but it never had the input legitimacy that you need in a democracy. Let's face it, we don't elect our executive. We only elect half of our legislative power, which is the European Parliament where we are. But you can never finish a law in this union if the council does not finish it, which means that the council actually has a veto power, a tacit veto power over our, our laws. And you don't, you don't elect the council to do what the council does. You, will, <coughs> you elect the members of the council as your domestic governments with the domestic agenda, domestic policy. What you have running the council most of the days is ambassadors. Mm -hmm. How can it be that you still have this vestige of when the politics of the European Union was mostly foreign politics? It isn't anymore. You know, the, 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 the Union is uh, home politics in its most concrete form. 
and well, in my country, you sense that when you you know you take the bus and you pay double what you paid last year, and it's because of the crisis. It's because the euro and the union, it's not foreign policy anymore. Mm -hmm. So you cannot have this institutional setup where the daily business of the council is being run by ambassadors. Uh, uh, well, you should, in my, in my sense, you should have, there you could have a repatriation of, of politics by electing councillors to the council. Mm -hmm. You elect two, Correper two and Correper one. You elect them as two councillors of every member state to the council. So you start to to make it more like a Senate. And you, 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 you devolve politics, either domestic politics or European politics, to the process. And then you can legitimize this input uh, uh, democracy that, that you need. If you, don't do, if you don't do that, then the crumbling down will be very quick. Mm -hmm. I see. Uh, Rita Vesh, you, you already are uh, running into uh, the, um, the, the possible solutions. Uh, to uh, the current uh, European Union problems. Um, Thomas Klau, um, can the European Union survive to this crisis? Do you, do you agree with the fact that it's a major, uh, we, are at, we are at crossroads now? It, it, it was uh, a short while ago something that could be described, I think, as the worst crisis the, Euro the European Union had uh, to confront. <coughs> I think the moment where there was at least in, in, in theory, if you like, a possibility of disintegration uh, is thankfully over. But what we have now is a situation where the measures taken so far have stabilized the crisis regarding the financial markets, um, have obviously not so far brought a solution to the issue of a recession, stagnation, uh, huge social pain, unemployment, in a number of wrongly called periphery countries of the Eurozone, mm -hmm. it has not brought an answer <clears throat> to the question, to the, to the urgent question of dividing a system of, the, the, word, the word that's usually used in the debate is economic governance. I think that's a nonsensical word because it obfuscates the real issue. A system of government for the Eurozone that is capable of administering to the Eurozone the, the macroeconomic policy mix that the Eurozone needs, the economic policy, if you like, that the Eurozone needs. For that, I agree with the previous speaker, maybe not the Union as a whole, that's, that's more debatable. Certainly the Eurozone, with its degree of integration, needs an executive. Mm -hmm. What we now have in the Eurozone, as in the EU, is, if you like, in a sense, in a, a government that is so fragmented, a government and its executive component, that it's almost invisible. Mm. Um, the Commission has a little bit of executive power, the European Council, which is wrongly called the European Council, it is really an assembly of national leaders. It should be the Council of National Leaders. And if you call it that, you explain a lot. It has a bit of executive power. Um, various institutions and organs around the EU have a bit of executive power. But there is not one locus that, A, can, can act efficiently and fast mm -hmm. in a sustained manner, and B, is identifiable to the citizens as the locus of power. What well, I think the Eurozone at least needs, perhaps the EU as a whole, is a government that is electable and ejectable. A government which people can vote for, and after four or five years, if they don't like the outcome, they vote for the other lot, you know, majority and opposition. I think that's the only way we can make a democracy work uh, in the long time. The, the model that uh, accompanied the development of the EU in its early decades, where there was the European Commission, which incarnated l'intérêt général, the general interest, mm -hmm. Um, that was a brilliant model to start the process, but that model has now come to an end. Mm. You cannot leave uh, the def definition of the union's common interests, common policies, to a, po a political hybrid which claims itself not to embody a political majority, but somehow, like by some operation of you know, a holy spirit, mm. to know what's best for Europe. I don't think that's the way to run. You wouldn't give world government to the IMF. It's, you know, that's, that's the, and so this is the process we need to manage uh, politically. Mm -hmm. And it's not just a political issue, it's an issue of democratic legitimacy, because as long as we haven't achieved that kind of government, uh, we won't have institutions efficient enough to deliver the EU and the Eurozone in particular, the prosperity and the conditions for prosperity that it needs in the long time, particularly in a world where other giants are rising. 
Uh, thank you. Marek uh, Magirowski, you've been quite critical towards the European institutions. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, what do you, um, what's your, uh, your major remarks on them? And uh, do you think they are responsible in their uh, organization for uh, the, um, the institutional blockade we are in now? Yes, I think this is uh, a very serious crisis we are undergoing now, not only in economic terms, but also in terms of social cohesion. Uh, and it is also an institutional crisis. I would like to make one specific point. I think uh, over the last five, six years, people have lost trust in two uh, models. They have lost trust in free markets and they have lost trust in, uh, uh, in the state. There are broadly, there have always been broadly two models in Europe, a liberal state and uh, a state which uh, dedicates a bulk of its energy to creating a very wide safety net of its, for its citizens. Uh, now, if uh, in almost all countries, and especially in the uh, peripheral countries of Europe, uh, people have lost trust in uh, liberalism and in uh, capitalism uh, because they blamed banks and savage financiers for sparking the crisis, and then, of course, there was a, a natural instinct to, uh, to uh, reach out for the state. We want the state to take care of us. We want the state to expand the safety net. We have been uh, taken, taken advantage of for so many years. But now it turns out that the state is not helping them. On the contrary, the state is taking money away from them. And the Portuguese and the Spaniards and the it Italians and uh, even some French are going now to the streets to protest against uh, austerity measures, which are making their lives much more difficult than uh, before the crisis. So this creates a very explosive environment because you have no model now to follow if you don't believe in the free markets anymore, if, if you no longer believe in the state as your ultimate savior, this creates a void, which is very dangerous for the European Union as an institution. Mm -hmm. yeah, w once uh, in Italy, um, there's an Italian reader with us, Enrico, um, we were thinking about Europe as a, a kind of, uh, Europe will come to help us when we are in trouble with our, uh, with our government, if our government is unable to help us. Uh, from your point of view, uh, is it the same with, uh, is it still like that, like that now, or the Euro, uh, Euro crisis is also affecting the relationship between the people and the European Union as uh, the trust people had in the uh, European Union? Well, I think uh, the, the, the political establishment of Italy is still in the same, uh, uh, ha still has the same attitude, uh, traditional attitude, at least the, the traditional parties. So they uh, tend to uh, expect Europe to uh, solve Italy's problems, basically. Uh, but uh, I guess the, the public opinion is, is uh, shifting against Europe, or uh, against the Euro, definitely, uh, but maybe even against, uh, against Europe or against the, the European project. And how, how, do, how does this come out, uh, in your opinion, politically or in, uh, on the electoral um, Well, plan? of course, there's uh, the great success of uh, Grillo's movement, the Five Star Movement, uh, mm -hmm. which has been a surprise uh, at the last uh, election. And that's, uh, it's difficult to, to uh, define it politically. Uh, I mean, it, it took votes from both right and left. It's something uh, completely new. It's, uh, it's a protest movement, but uh, uh, it's uh, the symptom that uh, something is changing. Uh, uh, I've read uh, uh, recently that uh, you know, Italian voters tend to ten, ten, uh, always vote, tended to vote for the same party. If, if you were uh, on, on the right side of the political spectrum, you would vote for uh, Berlusconi. If you were on the left side, for the communists or for uh, anyway for the uh, for the left. Uh, there, there were there are very there were used to be very few political conversions. 
but uh, this is not the case anymore. Uh, the people ha are losing their um, uh, uh, traditional political orientation. So uh, the situation is becoming more fluid, uh, which means uh, the political system uh, is uh, under pressure and could, uh, I, I don't know if anything is possible, but uh, it, it, it seems the public opinion is, uh, um, has no orientation anymore. Uh, they are losing, they have lost faith, faith uh, uh, not just in the state, because we, we don't really have faith in the state in Italy, mm -hmm. but uh, maybe faith in, uh, in, the, in the European project, in, the, uh, in capitalism, you know, in, free, in the free market economy. Mm -hmm. But there is nothing to replace uh, uh, our previous faith. We don't, we don't really have a new model. Mm -hmm. We have a, a protest movement, we have the past, the, the, the old political parties that, who uh, cling to, the, uh, to power, they, they, they want to keep power. But I don't think uh, the old political parties have a, a real uh, um, uh, idea how to get out of the crisis except uh, ask, uh, asking uh, the European Union to, uh, uh, to help us. And uh, the new protest movement is uh, uh, unpredictable. So, uh, François Dupont, in France, the state has been for a long time regarded as, a, as the savior, as the one who, uh, the entity that guarantees the st social stability and also, um, and also social benefits and so on. And Europe, was uh, just behind it. Does, uh, did the uh, institutional crisis change the, the relationship between people and the European Union uh, and European institutions in France or as far as you know? Um, yes, I think that um, for many French people uh, it was an habit to be pro-European. It was an habit too to think uh, with um, uh, a state, a provident state, alike in evidence. And uh, the hope that uh, the European future will uh, provide peace, jobs, prosperity, and uh, with the conservation of the high protection status was there until Maastricht. Mm -hmm. And after Maastricht, we have seen an, a turn because many people, many citizens have understood one thing. It was that without leaving the franc money with the creation of Euro, we were giving uh, a sovereignty, a part of sovereignty to something that is not a state to uh, this European Union. And this European Union is something that French people, French citizens, that do love politics, uh, don't understand how it works. And that's true. <laughs> yeah, but uh, here is uh, the key problem. If we look attentively, if we work, we study in order to, to try to understand, we first look after uh, media information and Press Europe do exist for, for a short time. Thank, thank you very much. But for a long time, it didn't exist at all. Second, yeah, we. Sorry. Yes, please, Rafa. You feel free to yeah, interrupt uh, yourself. I, I just want just to, to. Then to keep it short. Okay. Uh, uh, on one term, I think that the, the fact to, to divide the tools of economical policy to give the money here a part of the uh, budget competence at um, something who, who works at 28 and that all other countries keep the tax policies and budget policies is the main cause. It is the main cause. And after the 2000 crisis, for the first time we decided, but very locally, to, to have an economical revival, but till 2010, according to Mr. Reinhardt, Rogolf, and so on, who decided to come to austerity and the loss of confidence between citizens, two institutions, national and European, and the loss of confidence between European allies themselves, causes now this austerity.
I was a think tanker for 15 years. And obviously we can talk about models, we can talk about wonderful solutions. Uh, some people in my committee, in the Constitution <coughs> Committee, say this is the moment we should wake up and introduce federal solutions, change the system, and so on and so forth. But my idea is to come down you know, to reality and to the ground, uh, because we have to really think what uh, the people need. And I think that the debate about the European integration was also, also if you, you know, want to get theoretical about input and output legitimacy. I mean, people were saying this is not a very legitimate structure because, you know, those institutions are not elected. Even if they're elected, they don't carry much legitimacy. People are confused how it works and so on and so forth. What was the strength of the European Union was the output, that it worked, that it was effective. And I think that the biggest problem that we have right now is that always we had problems with input legitimacy, but the output doesn't work because the European Union doesn't work. And if we are going to come with wonderful solutions, you know, talk about changing the system and so on, no one will accept them. I mean, if you talk to the member states, if, even if you follow the, the, the debate here in the European Parliament, it's not going to happen. The question is, we got to do a pragmatic solution for the crisis. I mean, the European Union always has been developing in an organic manner. Whenever you were trying to impose something from top down, it didn't work. It didn't work in the 50s when you tried with the European defense community. It didn't work with the Constitution community, constitutional treaty because you called it constitutional. What we need is very simple. We need, first of all, the governments to, be, to, to, to actually behave when it comes to economics in a responsible manner. And secondly, we need to have certain order in the banking system. And that's exactly what we are doing through introducing the manners which leads to the banking union, which leads to the supervision of the banks, which may lead to certain aspects of the fiscal union. But this is the approach, a pragmatic approach, down to earth, uh, organic, and that's how the union always worked. But let's talk about Thomas that. Thomas It's very simple. The more federal and federalized the, the policy instruments, the, the institutions for certain policy areas in the EU are, the better they work. The less federal they are, the less they work. And that's why the programmatic approach, if you think it through, takes us straight to federalism. Now, there's many ways to organize federalism. The US is federal, Australia is federal, Brazil is federal, you know, you could argue Russia calls itself a federation of sorts, China is a non-democratic federation, if you like, and so on. So federation is not one single model. But fundamentally, uh, if you think pragmatism through, I think, in the right way, it leads you to federalism. If you apply pragmatism in such a way as to construct, you know, a piecemeal jumble of specific institutional arrangements to govern certain policies, you find that some of them don't work and you have already now created the most complicated system of government ever invented by man. Always this is, but this is a real problem. Seven member states have to agree to it. Well, uh, well, the US have 54, 54 member states and you know, it's slightly simpler. But don't compare so, the US to Europe. So one thing, well, well, one thing you could, uh, could, could say is that we must revisit uh, the issue of the veto. And you could imagine that the future constitutional development uh, in the EU or in the Eurozone might be achieved without every single member state having to agree to it. But I would like to make another point. Um, a lot of people say the EU, uh, the citizens have lost trust in the EU institutions. I think if you look carefully at what happened, yes, they have lost trust in, the act in, the, in today's set of politicians and the politicians in charge of the institutions today to deliver. And, and rightly so, because they made a terrible job of it. But at the same time, what I find very striking, that in the, in, the, in the midst of this huge crisis, which has affected a lot of citizens directly in their pocket, which has precipitated them to unemployment, created a fear of unemployment, in all the countries of the Eurozone, the majority of citizens continue to vote, in some cases overwhelmingly, for parties which want to continue with the EU and continue with the Euro. Because I, th I think citizens, in the vast majority, understand <coughs> that as difficult as it is and as unsatisfactory the EU in its present state is, if you give up on it, if you revert back to the nation state, you enter in a situation which is much, much worse. And I find that very encouraging. The EU, and the Eurozone in particular, has survived a test of legitimacy like it never has before. And I think that needs to be said more clearly and more loudly. Yes. Well, so thank you, Thomas Cloud, for having said the F word of Europe, which is federalism, of course. Marek Magyarovsky wanted to react. <laughs> you mentioned, uh, uh, I mean, there are three scenarios mentioned in the agenda of, uh, of this panel. Uh, federalism, uh, multi-speed Europe, and disintegration. And I would like to say that I don't believe in, in any of these scenarios. I think uh, all of them are unrealistic. Starting from federalism, which I think is, a, is not a viable option for the European Union as a whole. 
uh, the easy Eurosceptic answer would be to dismiss federalism as a, a preposterous idea bordering on utopia. But I think the truth is a little bit uh, more nuanced. And I would say that uh, federalism will never work in Europe because there are too few nations in Europe who have ever experienced it. Uh, Germans would uh, happily join the United States of Europe because they have always lived in a federation. Spaniards would happily join the United States of Europe because they have always lived in a federation. I think Mariano Rajoy, the Prime Minister of Spain, would be hugely relieved if Catalonia were governed directly from Brussels and not from Madrid. Uh, it's hard to mention any other nations who uh, have had... The Scottish the, nation, yes. the Welsh nation. Now, there is, a very, the there is also nation. a very handy uh, argument, uh, which I've already heard many a time, uh, precisely the United States of America. Mm. Uh, I would like to stress one thing. Uh, 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 millions of immigrants who came to America in the 19th century, uh, they didn't know what the state really is. I mean, Germans who were emigrating to uh, to America in the 19th century, especially in the first half of the century, uh, they didn't have a state, actually. It was Prussia, but Germany was not yet a state. Italians didn't have a state in the first half of the 19th century. The Irish wanted to decouple themselves from their own state, which was Britain. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's why it was much easier for them to engage in this uh, uh, labor to create a federation on the new soil. Now I think that's one of the most important obstacles now. Uh, it's a very, uh, it would be a very easy uh, solution for Europe to consolidate power uh, in uh, just a few institutions which would then impose their policies on all members of our organization. But I think uh, it would be equally challenging to re-establish the European Union as a monarchy. We have never been accustomed to a federation and we have long forgotten what a monarchy is. Now try to re-establish the European Union as a monarchy. I think some nations wouldn't object, <laughs> but some others would be quite terrified by that perspective. This is an important point because uh, uh, Many people do, do, when you speak about a federation, this is a big bugaboo for some people and some countries, and not for others who see that as a very natural outcome. So if we follow that line and go to the basics, what, what do the Europeans know? They know three things. Democracy. So if you talk about an European federation, maybe that's more complicated for the people. But if you tell them that what you want to do is European democracy, you know, Federation was not invented. It, it was not invented until the end of the of the 18th century. So maybe we are inventing something new. But what we have to guarantee to the people is that whatever comes out, it's democratic. They know prosperity, more or less, depending on the countries. But until the crisis, they were enjoying a good deal of prosperity, and that was part of the European pro promise. There would be a shared European prosperity. There have to be output ways, pragmatic ways to go back to that. Uh, that you cannot get without changing also the input ways because what people see nowadays about Brussels is that you know garbage in garbage out if you don't have a, 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 a democratic enough Brussels what you have is lobby power this lobby power will tell the, the Commission what to do and the Commission will do it it doesn't work that way but people see it that way mm -hmm. and that's already a big danger and the third thing that people know more or less in Europe is uh, fundamental rights. They've gotten it after, you know, uh, uh, terrible tyrannies in, in the East and the South as well. And they want to be assured that there will be European fundamental rights for everybody. So that your Hungarian minority in Romania has the same rights as the, uh, uh, you know, Slovak uh, minority in, in the Czech Republic or whatever. So what we have to do is to make sure that we get these this three things right. And the main one is European democracy. If it comes by the way of a federation, okay. If it comes by the way of uh, just doing some practical steps in what we have, 
you know, electing the commission and saying that the commission, yes, will be the executive. It's not a big step. Many people already see the commission at, as the executive. We can say that 500 million uh, European citizens, less 27 heads of government and state, see the commission as the executive. Then in the council they say, le conseil pose, la, la commission dispose. Well, let's change that. The commission is the executive, it must be elected. Mm -hmm. That's the first step. I'm not, it's, it does not turn us into a federation, but it turns you into a normal democracy. In all our countries, we elect and eject the governments. Secondly, for the countries that do wish, that do wish it, do what Oregon has done in the United States in 1913. The senators were not elected. The senators in the United States for over a hundred years were appointed by governors. Some were sold by governors. Uh, and in this small state in the Pacific Coast that nobody cared about, they decided, let's elect our senators. In three years, all the other 47 remaining states at the time decided also to do the same. When I ask in Portugal, do you know the name of your ambassadors in council? Because you know, the European Council is where your governments meet. You know the summits, but you don't know the everyday business of the Council of the EU, you know, a couple of streets from here, where two ambassadors, whose name you don't know, but that are much more important than the MEPs that, you know, some of the names you do know, uh, uh, are unelected. Well, people say, yeah, well, let's elect them. And that can be done at the national level by the countries that feel comfortable with it. If the UK doesn't want to do it, okay. But if Portugal or, or Malta wants to do it, I think it would, you know, in a, in, a, in a way, set a precedent because then Spain will say, I don't know about Rajoy and, and Catalonia, but I, I do know that if Portugal elects two councillors for the Council of the EU, I know that Spain will say, how come Portugal can and we can't? Well, I think, I think that we have to learn the lessons, you know, from, from our history, you know. I'm, I'm sitting in the Constitution Committee and I represent the EPP. And you know, we love to talk about different models, you know, the ways of actually resolving constitutional problems. We discuss the question of federalism all the time because we have federalists sitting there. But I think that the lesson stemming from the constitutional treaty is that people are tired of that. They, they are tired of discussions about, you know, the systems, institutions and so on, and our institutional naval gazing. What they want, they want the problems to be actually resolved. That's what they want. I mean, now, I think that the whole debate about, you know, federalism as such, first of all, tires people off. And it is misleading. I mean, there are many features, and many features of our system is already federal. It is true that if we want to resolve some of the problems, for example, if we want to have supervision of banks and so on and so forth, some of the solutions will be of a federal nature. But that doesn't mean that we are going to build a federation, especially that we don't really know what, what the federation is, because there are quite a, quite a lot of different models. However, what I'm trying to say is that, first of all, try to resolve the problems, but yes, I agree with you that there, there are ways in which we can actually increase you know, the, uh, the participation of the people and at least that they see that their decisions, electoral decisions, are somehow transmitted into the system. And that's exactly what we're working on right here. For example, if political parties were to elect you know, their candidates for the post of the President of the European Commission and announce them before the European elections. And then you would start fighting a real European elections on European themes. And then, for example, if socialists win the, 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 the fight in the European Parliament or the EPP wins because of the treaty, you know, we will be the ones nominating the President of the European Commission, then at least you have this link. The people say, okay, so, you know, we have enough of austerity, we want, you know, to, to choose the socialist, and then the European Commission has to adopt a program which is of a socialist nature. Okay, the final decision will be still with the member states, but at least the profile will change and then there will be this link. What I'm trying to say is that we have to be much more pragmatic in our approach. Try to resolve the problems which are at hand. And that requires pragmatic solutions, some of which may be of federal character. But I mean, I think that the debate about the institutional constructs and so on, it's totally misleading, especially that at the end of the day, it is the member states who are the rules of the treaty, and they will be the ones who are, who are going to decide. It is, it is misleading if you see it as a debate on, institu on institutional conceptualization. It's not about that. It's about the practice of people, you know, go to the United States, they have primaries there. Where are primaries in the Constitution? Nowhere to be found. But they are very important because they are of a democratic praxis, they, 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 they have a democratic nature, and they are you know, a constitutional praxis of the people of the United States. So they know that it's very important in those primaries to elect the two people that will fight for, for the White House. This you do need in Europe, not as a 
theoretical construct than in the Constitutional Affairs Committee, but uh, as something that the Europeans feel that they, they, they should be a part of. After all, you know, the, the Indian Union elects their Prime Minister. The Brazilian Federative Republic elects their, their, their President. You know, the United States as well. I don't think that people will see it as a you know, enormous step that will make them into a single country that they actually elect the people that are doing the policies. We already have a currency without a state, a currency with many countries. Maybe we can have a, well, a democracy with many countries. Will agree? Simple question. Well, I think that the member states will have to agree because you know th this mumbo jumbo about they coming to Brussels and then saying in their own countries that Brussels forced to do this at a point will reach a, you know a, a, a critical mass and people will say, well, then let's change Brussels. Because there are two ways out of this. Either we change Brussels and we have democracy at the, at the European level, or we go back to our countries, we have democracy and also our currency and our problems to solve at the national level. Of course, one can say in a global economy, that's, that, that's very hard. Who's going to build all those computers, uh, uh, cars, etc., onshore? Are we really sure that we want to have everything renationalized? Re well, if we are not, then let's instead of be, you know, bringing the policies to the national level, let's bring democracy to the European level. In fact, I think we, we have two problems uh, the EU is facing. One is, uh, you say, uh, Rafael Czeskowski, we have to find a solution in a pragmatic way, but how can we do this with an union that doesn't work? And the other is a, legit a, mm, a democratic legitimacy problem uh, that the European institution have, is that, as many of you pointed out, it's, uh, many of but the I, institutions I, I are not elected. But the problem is that, you know, I, I strongly disagree with the thesis that it doesn't work at all. I mean, the problem is that, that, that certain solutions that we've accept, accepted in the treaties. For example, we had, you know, we were hugely ambitious on monetary policy, but we didn't give the means to actually have economic policy which underpins that. That was the problem. And even when we had certain rules, for example, in the stability pact, they were simply broken. When we had the possibility to impose sanctions, no one was using them. And I think that there is a way when, we comes to the, when it comes to the crisis, there is a very pragmatic way, difficult but pragmatic, without changing the whole superstructure, without proposing some incredibly far-going solutions which are never going to be accepted by member states, there are ways of improving the system. I mean, if you look at simple things such as the, Euro the uh, European semester, where finally we are coordinating economic policies, where finally we are comparing what we are doing, and finally there is not only benchmarking, but there is also, at the end, sanctions which can be introduced. I mean, that slowly starts to work. And if we, if we are going to go the supervision of the, of the banking system and go further and to really install a real banking union with certain aspects of the fiscal union, this is going to give trust uh, in the markets when it comes to the financial markets and also it will slowly build the trust of the people and that doesn't really uh, you know necessitate a huge revolution although it's very problematic because member states think about it differently mm -hmm. what I'm saying is that we should focus on that mm -hmm. and and uh, well, last sentence and actually put our energy into this which is hugely difficult because member states think about it differently the parliament thinks about it differently then start talking about overhaul the overhaul of the whole system which is never going to be accepted even if you like it or not. Just what the fascinating Thomas. thing is to hear an MEP talk all the time about member states and not so much about citizens. Uh, I think that's, you know, you see the union through the prism of member states. I mean, that's a perfectly legitimate view, but there's another view, Jean Monnet, a union of the peoples. Um, in many ways, the positions here are not so different. You say we can have an incrementalist approach with federal features added to the system where it's needed to make it sufficiently efficient. You mentioned banking and it, union. And it is because of the European Parliament and whether those features are introduced. Certainly, certainly. Um, and there is, there is, of course, it's difficult to imagine uh, that you could have within the next five or ten years a big bang solution where, you know, by some fiat, a, a fully fledged federation that covers all aspects of government is introduced. But I think this brings us back to one problem which really has, isn't being discussed sufficiently yet, which has to be addressed. Yes, the notion that in the next 20 years you would have a situation where all 25 by that time, 30, 32, 34 member states of the Union, member states, some of which have referenda as an obligation, will agree simultaneously to an ambitious treaty reform is an unrealistic one. But that's because we, we are wedded so far to this principle of full uh, unanimity, and which means veto. It's a ludicrous thought to think that in, 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 a, in, a, in a whole of 30 parts, all the 30 parts must agree 
for the thing to be able to evolve, because that means we are frozen with the status quo forever, which, oh, is which may not be catastrophic, but it's at least deeply unsatisfactory. And I think the issue of revisiting, you know, the United States wouldn't be what they are today if, if, if the ratification of the American Convention had depended on unanimity. Yeah, but, but, but very shortly. First, first of all, when I, what I think about I'm directly elected, I think about citizens. And that's why I think when I go and talk to them, when I start telling them, you know, and we organize conferences about, you know, solutions, constitutions, treaties, and so on, they don't listen to me. They tell me, resolve our problems. And that's why I'm talking about resolution of the problems. And when it comes to the role of the European Parliament, when it comes to all of the things that I was just saying, European semester and so on, banking resolutions and so on, which brings it closer to the people, that's exactly what we are doing. But responding to your second question, I mean, the, the problem is that people think, and I've heard it for so many times, especially when we come to multi-speed integration, they think, yes, I mean, if a smaller, mem smaller amount of member states were to be more ambitious and go forward and so on and so forth. But if you look at the reality, then it's bogus. Because some people think if you throw away, you know, the Great Britain, which has different, different ideas, then states would actually create something federal or they would be much more ambitious. Look at the differences between France and Germany on every single point. If it comes to, for example, the banking union, when it comes to the euro bonds, when it comes to the philosophy of changing uh, the, 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 the European economic policy, which is the most important. They cannot, disagree, they cannot agree on most of the points. You know, there, are, there is no, and, and the question is, the question is, the question is, where? Yeah, but, but we, we are always thinking about countries as the main unit. Mm -hmm. You know, in the last four or five years, we have, met, we have gone so many steps backwards because now we say France wants this, Germany wants that. It, it, looks, it, it seems like reading papers from 1913, really. Mm -hmm. It's not like that, you know. Uh, uh, Portuguese progressives and, and French progressives and German progressives all want a new deal for Europe, let's say. You know, Polish conservatives and uh, UK conservatives and Maltese conservatives all want to have austerity. You know, there's, always, there's also the people equation here, and that's one that has not been put in place. So, okay, let's agree that federation means different things for, for different people. Let's agree that constitutional debates are quite complicated and sometimes, you know, uh, 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 even technically ridiculous. But let's also agree that there's no way that a continent with 500 million people educated people that have access to information will accept going on without European democracy for a long time. No, no, and that's really. also part of what, or, 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 or what, or, or what we need to, to tell to our citizens, which is, you know, uh, how do you think that the Cyprus problem was there? How, how do you think that that's terrible solution about Cyprus banks and everybody was on panic after, you know, after they knew what was on the, so, or, or, on the decision was there? Well, that was because the decision-making process is terrible just, and is going on being time. terrible. Yeah. Rui, Rui just, just one thing. The problem is that the, the questions are not, the, 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 the answers and the decisions are not taken by referendum you know, in member states, but at the end of the day, when it comes to constitutional changes by states. But I will just give you one example. What's the way forward? Is to strengthen the European political parties. What's the way forward? For example, we proposed, you know, to elect at least 10% of the members from transnational lists to induce that thinking when it comes to cross-party European election. And what happened? Most of the people in almost all of our political parties in the European, in the European Parliament rejected that because that was too ambitious for them. I mean, that's the problem that we are facing. Whatever we propose when it comes to increasing democracy, increasing the role of European political parties in this constitutional yeah, committee, well, then it's defeated uh, uh, in the plenary. But, but then why? Because our we, European political parties are made by national political parties. You know, if you have nine parties in Europe with not many members, each, each, each of them, you can have a European political party. But if you collect 10, 10, 10 million signatures from Europe and you say, I want to build a European political party, you cannot. It's still national. It still depends on national parties. And of course, national parties will say, we want our national power. Okay, thank you. Yes, uh, we were talking about citizens. There's one who would like to talk. Please, uh, Francois. Citizen, uh, I would like to say that uh, what do uh, European citizens expect? What they expect is to be protected by uh, a complete system and to have it clear and democratic. It is not clear, it is not democratic, and those who work or, or who read books and books and so on discover that it's a part, a huge part of the problem itself. The separation of competences, something that has been big, uh, who began, who is not achieved. The job has not been done to, to, to the end. 
So when you put your money with several states inside uh, something, you decided to make one country. You decided to make one nation. It's not the old, old fashioned nation. It's a cosmopolitan nation. Uh, with Polish, with Portuguese, uh, and so on. But citizens do accept that. It is not a problem for us to, to say thank you to the federal state and thank you for the part of competencies well served to citizens at the national stage. That's what we want. Is it more clear? More simple. Tell me, tell me why, why those, more clear and those simple? Those MEPs rejected the proposal of introducing transnational lists uh, with 10 percent, am I right? 10 percent of uh, candidates coming from other countries. Not because the project was too ambitious, but because they were afraid they would have 10 percent fewer slots on their own parliamentary lists. And that, of course, makes the chances of being elected much slimmer. Uh, so this is not only about ambition, it's, uh, well, it's about personal ambition, <laughs> maybe. Uh, well, I would like to pick up on what uh, Rui said about uh, uh, the undemocratic elements or, or not fully democratic elements in the architecture of power in the European Union. Of course, it is a very nice, a very tantalizing idea to give more power to ordinary citizens. Uh, let them elect the president of the European Council, let them elect the president of the European Commission. But I think there are, uh, there are limits to what you can achieve with democracy. Uh, uh, there are some constitutional tools now written into law in Europe that allow you to make uh, the EU more effective, more present, if you like, on the world stage. And um, the political elites decided a few years ago to elect or to appoint, which is, I think, uh, uh, a more adequate term, Mr. Van Rompuy as the president of the European Council and to appoint Ms. Ashton as the high representative. Uh, well, they are anything but charismatic, I think. Uh, I think Europe needs uh, more charismatic personalities at the top, even without uh, citizens voting for them. I mean, it w I, 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 I would like to stress it very, very uh, clearly that it would be a very nice scenario in which uh, we could elect uh, all the most important figures in the European architecture of power directly. But I think we, th there are some uh, tools in place right now which we can use to make Europe more effective, and we are not using them. Please, if people François? are useful as uh, Mrs. Ashton or Ms. Mr. Van Rompuy, that uh, we perfectly see inefficient because they have no the power to decide. Uh, what about the, the decision making inside this Europe? It's not only a problem to vote, to give a vote. Yeah, uh, Eric Ramo, um, from a citizen's point of view, uh, does Europe have a face or an identity or s uh, a face that mm, the citizens can identify with uh, Europe or is it far from uh, the citizens? Well, I, I, I always thought you can have uh, several identities, so you can uh, feel uh, Italian and European uh, at the same time, or Genovese, uh, Romano, Romano Torinese, and so on. So uh, we are experts uh, <laughs> expert at multiple identities. Uh, uh, but I think the, the current crisis has uh, um, uh, made us more uh, hostile towards each other. The public opinions are. Uh, uh, have grown apart from each other in the current crisis. So, uh, from a strictly uh, political point of view, it's uh, I would like a federal Europe, but I understand this is the uh, the worst moment to propose a federal Europe, <laughs> or, or the worst. But, well, uh, the my, my perception of what I what I uh, read in the, in the comments of uh, German uh, readers on press, press Europe is, is that uh, they are scared of a federal Europe right now because they, uh, they feel uh, they, are in a, they would be a minority in a, in a federal a Eurozone. Minority, the eh? uh, uh, lost in a sinful yeah, majority. Yeah, in a sinful yes. majority, uh, in a majority of a profligate uh, nations. So they, uh, they fear they would uh, be outvoted and uh, the, uh, the, a federal democracy would uh, 
uh, allow the su southern Europeans to decide how to spend German money, basically. And so I guess the, the opposition within Germany to a, a federal uh, eurozone right now would be enormous. I don't think it's, uh, uh, if it's I, don't know, I don't know if it's possible to overcome that and how it, uh, But you see, it depends how you frame the issue. Uh, if you say you know, we're going to create a structure which has the power to uh, spend your money for them and that's it, you know, um, then of course you have a problem. But if you say we're creating a federal structure which will ensure that the terrible crisis we've lived through in the last five years will not happen again, then you have a different proposition. And, and yes, it's the worst and the best moment. I believe, maybe, probably naively, that if that at the height of the crisis, when two years ago, when there was really a threat of disintegration, where things looked really bad, we, we, we'd had leaders, national leaders, who hadn't come into government with the approach that I want to be a good manager of the status quo, because that's what all of, they are, all of them are, Angela Merkel, Francois Hollande, David Cameron. They all went into politics with the ambition to be good managers of the status quo. And suddenly they're faced with a situation where the status quo blows up in their face, and they don't know what to do. But if we'd had a different cast of leaders with a different mindset, a different generation of leaders, um, who said, look, this is a terrible crisis, this is the result of insufficient institutions, poor policy decision, lacking supervision of banks, excessive deregulation, the lack of policy instruments to go with monetary policy, and so on. And now we're going to propose a big bang. Now, in the midst of this terrible crisis, we're going to make a huge step. I think it would have been possible to channel the fear of the decision that, that, that things get worse into accepting a new model. And I think that moment has passed. I think that moment has passed, and we will move on a more gradualist and more inter incremental road, rather like yours, or rather like the American road of the US, because they took over a century, 150 years, to get to the point of federal equilibrium where they are now. But you touched upon one interesting fact. I mean, let's assume for a moment that they agree for a federalist big bang. Then what happens with budget? With the budget? Because the problem is that, you know, th there, there are those in the European Union who are full of, you know, federalist rhetorics and they say, yes, we have to strengthen the institution, even think about federal solutions. And then when they, the same leaders, when then they have to take decisions on, for example, you know, the budget of the European Union, which now stands at less than 1% of the GDP, whereas the federal budget is 20% in, in the US, you know, they take completely different decisions. When, you know, they sometimes their, their mouths are full of federalist rhetoric, when then it comes, for example, to actually sharing competences, some of which might be needed, for example, to actually install the banking union, they backtrack, they start backpedaling when it comes to certain decisions and so on and so forth. I mean, you know, where is coherence there? That's why when I hear, you know, those, the, the talk about, you know, making it more ambitious and so on and so forth, and I don't see it followed at all with, the, uh, with, with those, the, those, those decisions, then I think that it simply leads us nowhere and that there's just a simple doublespeak. If, if you wait for national leaders to act, if you wait for the so-called European Council, which is the Council of National Leaders mm -hmm. to act, sure. I agree with you, you can wait till you're blue in the face, they will only act, and they have only acted this lot, when they were faced with the abyss. But, but this but, hasn't always been the case. You know, don't, at, yeah. This hasn't always been the case. Um, I mean, I don't want to romanticize the past, but Francois Mitterrand, Helmut Kohl, and the others with them, no agreed to embark on a monetary union in 1988, sure. uh, before the war came down, and it was not a price for German unification. So you have moments in history where national leaders, and it's partly accidental, do develop the common ambition to do something. But I think today what you have to forget about national leaders, or recognize them for what they are and what they can do, they and, create different, and to create different dynamics. You have to, wait, to work through maybe I'm naive, citizens, political parties, lobbying, win the debate, win the ideas. And the, and the proposal you brought, brought up, which is you know, the old Delors idea, to uh, connect the nomination or the election of the Commission President to uh, the European elections, is a pragmatic one, doesn't need treaty change, is hugely important, because I think it could really transform the political dynamics in Europe and, and, and be a big step towards Parliament parliamentarization. This is what, why the, the national leaders have resisted until now, and my hope is that with your help and yours and everyone else's around the table, in 2014, this change, which doesn't need treaty change, will be effective, because I think that's a real source of uh, potential positive movement. I would also add two things to that proposal that were voted when we voted the resolution, namely that the candidates have to have programs 
Otherwise, they will choose their programs in their first meeting with the council. We don't want that, so we put that in the resolution that the Constitutional Affairs Committee prepared. And the second one, which is very important for Press Europe and the citizens to make good on it, is that the campaign must be pan-European, meaning that these candidates have to present their programs in every member state. Otherwise, we will have you know, a campaign conducted between Berlin and Paris, and there are many countries in Europe that... Yeah, exactly. When it, comes, when it comes to pragmatic solutions and creating certain and pressures. I mean, if we had a real European elections, for example, that in my country it wouldn't be, you know, about judging the government because we can do it a year later, yeah. but really asking the citizens what they want when it comes to Europe, what sort of responses it should bring. I mean, th this is going to create pressures for change. And for change, again, mostly probably when it comes to policies, when it comes to the budgetary means and so on and so forth, more than, than institutions. But we need to create that pressure through the, this sort of thinking That's and through these sort of reforms, which are kind of down to earth, huge opposition from member states, but this, is, this does not mean that it takes power away from states, but it actually changes the focus of the discussion. It's true, and let me just say it in a, in a sentence. I dream with the day where you know, a French president or a German chancellor will say, I don't take any orders from you or whatever, because I have been elected by, uh, uh, you know, Seven, 70 million French or Germans, 80 million, I don't know how many you are now, and the President, of the, okay, and the President of the European Commission will say, well, that's very fine and legitimate, but I have been elected by five, 500 million European citizens, including your Germans as well. Yeah. That changes a lot, even though you may not change a line in the articles of, 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 the, of the treaties. François? To, to give a word for Enrico, uh, what we see in France, and I think it's the same thing in Italy, it's that the classical parties are losing their influence. So, um, uh, miracle people uh, having courage and virtue, and I don't believe uh, uh, it's possible because they, are, they lose confidence with the citizens and because there are fractures inside about Europe, and the fractures are the same as the extreme on the parties, that's to say against Europe, but far against, mm -hmm. or for, and far for. And inside the classical parties of government, you can find the same thing. So you, you have something, new cards are, are, are going to go. Uh, I perfectly agree with you. What will make the, the, all of uh, Europe, the European, um, feel it's true that something happened is to say pan-European parties. Yes, it's the only, the sole thing that can prove to you that a national leader is not here to tell us to go for Europe or against Europe, only to become president of the Republic. Why is it, why is it, why is it not delivers happening? delivers an answer. You know, many people said for many years, it's nonsense. You can, you can have no such thing as a pan-European or pan-EU politically debate because it's too naturally fragmented. Well, the crisis gives the answer. Now you have the debate. You'd have the left. I'd simplify, saying, saying a bit less austerity. Yeah, but the, the core issue today, you'd have the left candidate um, saying we need less, less austerity and more, you know, whatever, Keynesianism. And you have the conservative candidate saying full, uh, full, full power head for austerity-based deficit reduction. That's the main debate across the Eurozone and almost across the EU today in Europe, and it's a perfect debate for 2014. At the same time, of course, you have to acknowledge that there will be national differences which play. But look at the US president campaigning in the US. His message in Oregon is not quite the same as in uh, Idaho. When, when he speaks in Texas, it's a little bit different from what he would say in California. You know, there is a sort of fine tuning there. And, and that's, that, that works. It's complicated, but it works. And then there's the issue of language. People will say, yeah, but there's a lack of a common language. That is a huge problem. And then people say Switzerland, that's too small, it doesn't count, you know, they're a bit crazy. Or bit, but, I mean, they're, they're, they're too, not crazy, <laughs> but they're too specific. To, but look at India. Not a perfect democracy, but India is a huge democracy, a complex continent. It is a democracy um, which lacks a common language. They manage like the European Parliament. And it, it's not perfect, but what is? Even Switzerland isn't, but it works. And there's an added advantage for us because the Indians have many castes. You know, you have the, 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 yeah, the Brahmins. Uh, we we, are, we only have two, which is the bankers and the rest. So. <laughs> Mar Marek, you want to yes, react? I, I, uh, it's, it's of course a brilliant idea to force candidates to lay out their own pan-European vision, but I think it's um, 
your expectation is uh, a bit over optimistic. I, I can't imagine, for example, the energy policy or the geopolitics of the energy policy is one of the most ticklish and hotly debated issues now in the, uh, in the European Union. I can't imagine a candidate which would uh, be capable of presenting a coherent vision of the uh, EU's energy policy, both to the voters in Spain and in Poland, uh, with uh, two different uh, energy policies, absolutely incompatible. And uh, how do you do that? I, I was in Brazil when they discovered oil in Rio. And of course the Cariocas, as you call the people from the state of Rio de Janeiro, wanted the, the oil for, for, for themselves because it was on their shores. And you cannot have a coherent economic policy for the Amazon and Rio Grande do Sul and, and, and uh, you know, the, what they call the Central West, Mato Grosso. And you know, it was up to the candidates at the time, you know, Lula and José Serra. Then, you know, it's, not, it's never completely coherent. That's why you need elections every four no, years or that's, every that's five years. Question, it, but it's a question, that's why I do, I do not see, you know, a need for a revolution. What I'm saying is, you know, for example, when we were debating this transnational list, some people were saying when we introduce, you know, 27 members of EPP on the transnational list, it will change everything, it will create European public space, blah, blah, blah. Of course not. Yeah. But it's an experiment. At least, you know, what, what I want, you know, I want the debate in European elections to be more European in a sense that people would think, okay, most of the answers to our problems now lie in Europe. So let's talk about the different recipes that the socialist may have and that the EPP might have. Of course, it will be immensely difficult to have one coherent vision on all the issues, for example, you know, defense, energy, and so on and so forth. But it will be pretty sufficient to have an answer to three or four most nagging problems, like, for example, how to deal with crisis. Or secondly, for example, what vision for uh, transatlantic policy, which is one of the biggest niches you know, for development. Or for example, when it comes to uh, protection of, of, of data, what do you really need? Do you want you know, a full protection of, of data on the internet? Or do you need full protection of data, but with a model which is going still to allow for certain business models to be you know, continued in, in Europe and so on and so forth. I mean, there are those debates, for example, for young people, which are much more important than talking about you know, what is your policy towards Russia, on which we disagree in the European Union. So I mean, if we at least step by step could Europeanize the debate more, step by step sell the message to the people, really, your problems are resolved in Europe and we need your support for pragmatic solutions in order to mend these problems and to present programs on three or four issues which are most important, that would be a huge improvement on what yeah, we have now. Uh, Rafael Treskowski, how, how would you Europeanize the debate? That would mean uh, national politicians would have to uh, explain their public opinion that the issues are European and not nationals while they are asking only for votes in their countries. No, but I'll give you one example. For example, mm -hmm. what we are now working in the stat is the statute of European political parties. If, for example, you know, the EPP would get its act together and two months before the elections say, you know, our candidate for the president of the European Commission is X. This is his program, six points. Then this guy would campaign in all of the states. For example, when people vote for my party, you know, on the ballot, there would be civic platform, but EPP as well. So they could see that we are a part of a bigger family, which actually is influential in the, in the European Parliament. So that when they vote for us, they vote for a certain vision and for influence in the European Parliament. That would slowly Europeanize the debate. And we would start talking about, at, at least we would have a chance to start talking about the problems which would be on the manifesto. When we would have Martin Schulz with a very strong personality from the EPP fighting on issues, that would actually you know, put the focus of the debate somewhere else. But listening to you, it seems that this might happen, but it also might not. Why, why would it not happen? Well, I mean, this is it's the proposal. You, I mean, this is the proposal the of the European Parliament. You know, we are driving the debate, mm. uh, and that's what I'm saying. That we are listening to citizens. We are trying to provide for solutions and so on, and to make steps forward. But at the end of the day, and I have to say it, even though I'm a European parliamentarian, are the member states who are the masters of the treaty, who have to agree with us in a trialogue on the statute of political parties, and who are unwilling to accept certain compromises. We push, mm. and that we'll see how effective we are. Why, they, why would they change? The Jeu de Pomme in Brussels. <laughs> we are the people, we are the power. The Brussels oh. Spring. The Brussels <laughs> Spring. <laughs> from, uh, we'll be lucky with, a, from, with an European Spring, you know, with, with many uh, Tahrir squares around Europe. Yeah. <laughs> I think that will, you know, happen earlier. From, uh, from a European point of view, it's uh, 
uh, we cannot understand that the European Parliament has no initiative of the rights of the laws. Mm -hmm. it, it, it's a nonsense for us. It's the proof that the states themselves created a sort of monster with 27 heads and a master European Commission and just allow European Parliament to co decision on very uh, thin targets and, 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 and on budget. And without a deadline. That's the yeah. most important thing because, you know, you, well, I, I'm sure that many of us have had this experience. You can have uh, half of your homework, so half of a law prepared, even if it's in a, on a matter of life and death. And then you wait for the Spanish presidency, the Belgian presidency, yeah. the Hungarian presidency, the, Pol time. the Polish presidency. And, you know, if they don't want to finish, the Danish presidency, and you go on because they don't have a deadline. You know, the deadline in India, 14 days. Mm. You know, the deadline in Brazil, five days for the Senate to say if they want to comment on the law or not. Mm. Otherwise, it is law. So, you know, what the council actually has is a tacit veto power. Of course, it's so technical at times that it's not easy to scandalize people with this. But, but it is a scandal, problem, because yes, you have a law and it may it never no get finished. But the never. Problem, the, the institutional problem is also that you know, the European Parliament, uh, and uh, it takes me great pains to say it as a European parliament, parent, parliamentarian, but it's not enough. I mean, the thing is that when it comes to the crisis, you know, most of the competence is still national. And I mean, if we get national parliaments on board in order to actually have this European debate, not by creating new institutions and some want, but at least, you know, have solutions, pragmatic solutions in which national parliaments cooperate with the European Parliament in order to give legitimacy to the whole process and Europeanize the debate, then we are, I think that then we, are, we, we will strive for a success. So that it needs much more than just, you know, uh, work here in the European Parliament, which is hugely important, but I mean it has to be supported by national parliaments, by citizens, in order to actually Europeanize the debate. And it's not going, as I say, it's not going to change the whole system one day, but at least it will create a possibility of actually focusing people's attention where the problems are and what is the need of, in order to resolve them and create a certain pressure on governments actually to follow. But we, we don't believe to promises with that system. What you said, you, you are sincere, I believe uh, you, you are. But we take it as only promises with a structural uh, machine that cannot afford the promises it, it makes. Uh, Eric Norma, would you vote for uh, a foreign candidate in the European elections if they were allowed to run in your country? Yeah, why? Yes, I would. De definitely. Yeah. And do you think most of the citizens would? Yeah, because you are up with the Italian ones. Because I, I, <laughs> yes, that's, no, that's but possible. I think, huh? I, I think Obama would win an election in, in Europe. He's not even an European, so I don't think that's that. People will prefer him to, to whatever comes from. Because there's also the the, 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 or the, the language obstacle. It's not easy to campaign in a country where you're not understood and no one knows you, isn't it? Uh, I, yes, I guess it's difficult, but, but, but the problem is, uh, is wide, it's, it's bigger because we don't have a, a common public opinion, we don't have a common uh, uh, a way to confront, to, to exchange ideas uh, at, uh, the, at the level of the, of the Eurozone. So um, what I see is that uh, the discussion about the crisis itself is quite different in Italy than it is in Germany. Uh, uh, the solutions are um, dealt with uh, in a totally different way. The, um, but it depends who would you put on a list. You know, if, if you were put, for example, Jacques Delors on a list, I'm absolutely certain that he would get quite a lot of votes outside of France. Mm -hmm. If you would put Lech Wałęsa on the list, I'm pretty sure that he would get quite a few votes outside of Poland, maybe even more outside of Poland than in Poland. Because, I mean, he's, seen as, a, he's <laughs> seen as a great, you know, symbol of a revolution, but by many not as a great, you know, president. So, I mean, it all depends on what sort of candidates you would put on a list. I mean, for example, you know, I was always saying when we were working on the transnational list, I mean, Václav Havel has passed away. But, I mean, if Václav Havel was on the list, I would, I would gladly vote for him, you know, have voted for him because, unfortunately, he's, he's passed away. So, I mean, it, it all depends on the candidates. And, and we are not talking about, you know, we were talking about just 25, member, 25 uh, people, you know, chosen from that list and the rest, 725 chosen on the national list. Mm -hmm. But that would actually bring about a very small change in, in the debate, at least, because it would not create a huge European, European public space and make us forget about, you know, where we come from. But it would, you know, change the pivot of the discussion. But, but, but the, list, 
the list is gone now. But no, let, 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 let me challenge you as a member of, of the Constitutional Affairs Committee for something. You know, while you're discussing pan-European parties, let these pan-European parties be created directly by citizens without having to have first national parties. Because you say, you know, Civic Platform and the EPP. Why cannot there be, let's imagine, an European Libertarian Party that you don't have to wait to have nine national parties to create it, but if you have 10 million uh, European citizens with signatures from many countries, you directly create the European Party. Why, why is it so? It, it, it does not work that way either in the United States, the Brazil or others. Sometimes you have states parties, the Iowa Rural Party, for instance, but people can go directly and apply and, and be a member of, of, the, an, of the European I'll Party. Answer. I'll give you an answer. Because we would have to, I mean, we would have to change the treaties. And in order to do that, we would have to have the convention and so on and so forth, and it would take years. Because the problem is that for now, you know, the <laughs> member states cannot even agree for the European Parliament to be still responsible for the registration and verification of European parties. Even when they are created, you know, from seven member states, seven national parties. Member states don't want to do it, and the Council's legal opinion is that it's against the treaties. Even this. A simple fact of registering and verifying who, what's, who is a European party or not. If maybe, you wanted to be as ambitious as you, you'd have to change the treaties. Maybe that's you know. a blessing in disguise. Right. I, I like maybe that's a blessing in disguise. And you say European political parties are, for the moment, just associations that you can form when you have 10 million signatures from you know, uh, at least 10 member states. I would like, I would like to remind no, you, gentlemen, that them. there was such, uh, one such party, which was called Libertas, and it was clubbered at the European Parliament election a few years ago. And uh, it was uh, apparently set up at the right moment with the right ideas, uh, with a pan-European campaign, and it suffered a very painful defeat. Yeah, yeah because they, 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 they still need the national, national parties. Party. And sometimes the national parties that you get are shady, but to say the least. That, so risk, that's that risk will always be there. I mean, uh, you, you can't base your pan-European party on uh, newcomers and on people who have never had anything to do with politics. Yeah, you, ba you, you base it on citizens, but on the case, well, since it's a European party, good luck. Okay. you know, if you want to form a new European party in Poland, I assume that you, you, you need to have, a, you know, I don't know how many thousand signatures for, uh, of Polish citizens. So what I'm suggesting is the European political parties should, do, should be the same. They should not be the monopoly of national parties. They should be a matter of European citizens wanting to create them. Okay, we are now entering the last 10 minutes to be large uh, of our debate. Um, what will I would like to make uh, a last round of the table? Um, what will be, uh, in your opinion, the, uh, the main stake uh, at um, the main issue at stake in the 2014, 2014 European elections? Well, I mean, the problem is that what I'm afraid of is that the main stake of elections in my country will be how you assess the government. I mean, that's, that's the reality because that's what the people are concerned with. Mm. But obviously, I mean, if we were to be successful in actually Europeanizing the, the, the debate, I mean, the people will ask a question, you know, how are you going to resolve the problem of the crisis? How are you going to give us guarantees that it's not going to come again? And most important problem that we have in Europe, and I think on that we'll all agree, is the unemployment with the young people. So, I mean, and which is tied to the crisis. So, I mean, if, if someone is unable to answer that question, you know, what is my point of view, how to come out of the crisis and how to resolve that problem, I mean, you shouldn't even come to the European elections. And I think that this debate, all of the changes that we are talking about, at least it will allow us to send a clear message to the, to, to, to the citizens. Listen, European elections are very important. In my country, the turnout is 24%. You have to go there and not talk about national politics, you can do it a year later, because the answers to your problems now, in 80%, 70% when it comes to crisis, are taken on a European level. So have influence. Well, uh, to put it very shortly, austerity versus fiscal expansion, as Mr. Klaus said, that will be the main debate. And uh, although it's not a perfect debate on theoretical terms, on practical terms, it is a very good debate for for an election campaign. So I hope that it will focus the minds and that you know any choice, if it is democratic, will be the choice for the next years, then it will be judged on its merits, not on the kind of you know conceptual confusion that we now have in Europe. Thomas Clough. 
Well, I, I won't repeat myself, but I think it's actually in practice going to be a mix of the two. I hope that that's going to be, I mean, that's the debate that, has, that is already there. Mm -hmm. You just, it's, you know, it's, and it's cross-European. Cross and then there will be a referendum, unfortunately, on each national government's performance, uh, which will interfere in ways which will be sometimes disruptive, I think, of France in particular, uh, with the overall picture that emerges. My, my hope is that if there is a huge increase in the... Uh, in, the, in what I would call the dangerous uh, populist vote uh, in the next European elections, this will act as a wake-up call uh, and send an electroshock to the, into the political parties, into the, Euro the Council of National Leaders and into European public opinion. I, I envisage a, a, quite a significant rise of, uh, of extremist elements mm -hmm. in various uh, countries, from the right and from the left, and uh, the second point is, uh, I think the European leaders will have to come out with a very uh, coherent uh, proposal uh, on how to kickstart growth in Europe. Is it possible to boost growth in uh, Europe uh, with austerity or not? So uh, I think that you're right uh, for citizens, for the previous campaign, Either we, we, we are speaking about a constitution of a federal state or something else, perhaps not a completely federal at the first step level, but something clear, understandable, that could have money in order to give prosperity. Because European Union, we are quite convinced, not only because of the sign of the actual budget and so on, it has not the, the, the requirements to, to, to give new policies, uh, pragmatical results, uh, not at all. So w we don't trust in that anymore. We want to see the different projects. Uh, either we want a federal state on a presidential regime, uh, other uh, with a parliamentary system. Some will say that we, we want big and uh, We want to see your projects. Well, I'm afraid uh, the electoral campaign for the, for the European Parliament is absent from the, uh, is not really covered, uh, not, not yet, uh, on uh, the national press. So um, I hope uh, it can be the, the, the start of a European, uh, Eurozone-wide discussion about the issues, uh, but that's uh, just a hope for now. Uh, it, right now, uh, the discussions are at, at the national level, uh, even not just among, uh, among politicians, but also among, among the people. Uh, we don't really have the uh, opportunity, uh, because of language barriers, basically, to discuss uh, with each other about the issues and to understand each other. Well, Press Europe is a partial ex exception to that, but uh, it's, uh, it's a quite a small uh, um, opportunity. Okay, uh, I think the vast, the great majority of people still uh, uh, discuss and debate uh, on their national press, uh, on national sites. So uh, we are, we, we don't really interact uh, to each other, and that's a great uh, um, limit. Are, it's a, are people around you already talking about European elections, or they even don't know there no. there will be uh, no, next no. year. They're not talking about the European elections. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, so I just one last word, and after yeah. we have to close. just to say that people involved in associations, um, even not in political parties, are much closer to the impact of the results in June. Of the Thank you very much, all of you. Uh, we've been finishing on time. I think it has been a good debate. I thank you very much for coming. And I hope uh, you will continue to read Press Europe and we will continue to have those debates uh, along uh, the year that separates us from uh, the European elections because we think it's a good way to uh, raise awareness of citizens on the European topics and on the European elections. Thank you very much and bye-bye.